Thank you very much to the New South Wales Farm Riders Association, uh, to Cathy and to Karen uh, for, for the invitation to be here today. Um, I hope this isn't a bit down and dirty for you after, I guess, the global big picture. Um, we run a large scale cattle business, as was mentioned, for New South Wales, I always say, with the big end of the small end of town. Um, and so we, um, we send cattle to every state of Australia, so we, we, we incur all sorts of uh, experiences with, in doing that. And we also send genetic products overseas. We joined the bovine Yoni's disease market assurance program 21 years ago, the year it started in 1996, so I have quite a long history and a few bit of commentary to make about um, the biosecurity uh, management of Yoni's. And this is very much a personal view, uh, informed by, I guess, my experience in our farm business, state, national and some international experiences as well. I would see uh, on-farm biosecurity as the ultimate risk management challenge. And of course the best outcome is nothing, i.e. nothing happens. <laughs> and um, um, and when, when I, when in my nine years at MLA, I guess when we were looking at um, a portfolio of investments, I always said, well this is, uh, this is really um, decreasing the negatives, this is the risk management side of our um, portfolio. Next to the weather it sits as the most uh, significant risk to our business continuity. When we refer to biosecurity, we do include weeds, pests and diseases. And I guess in action I call it on-farm fear. Mm -hmm. uh, when I think about an FMD outbreak or a BSC, or the things that might affect our business, and uh, you probably haven't experienced getting a positive test on a Yonish check test, and then waiting uh, for the next result and pos a possible slaughter of an animal, um, expecting a false positive, but not really knowing till you get the result. But it is, it does create immense fear. Um, when I look at the landline program recently on POMS in the oyster industry, um, Pacific Oyster Mortality Syndrome, I could really feel the anguish of those oyster farmers because I could imagine what that was like if that was us in our business. I think for us it's where's the balance between good policy and regulatory activities versus our capacity in research, development and innovation. How we slipped into a mindset of controlling disease outbreaks rather than continuing to invest in prevention through research and global activities. So what have we done well in the past? And I'm glad that the TB and uh, brucellosis eradication program has been mentioned because it was so significant. Uh, I've, I've read a few reports in leading up to today. 92, 94 million dollars was the estimate of the cost of the program in 1992. So just try and translate that into today's uh, dollars and think about that. Highly significant in terms of reduction of commercial losses but also significant in terms of market access to global markets and some human health issues. So, so really a bit of a trifecta there in results. Um, and I'd ask you just to think about this. The other day I was asked to go and speak at something really different called the Festival of Sustainable Living in uh, Melbourne and uh, I was on a platform with Peter Singer talking to vegans and vegetarians who probably wouldn't have eaten our lunch today. And um, when I got to one of my key points about reducing emissions, I said, well, it would be really good if we got rid of the million camels and the um, buffalo and the, and, um, the donkeys and, and all the other um, ruminants that are running around our, um, our parks and our, our landscape. And um, the moderator turned to Peter Singer and said, are we allowed to do that? And it made me reflect on the TB and brucellosis campaign and wonder would the water buffalo actually, you know, in the, today's environment, would the urban environment actually allow us to do that? And that's, that's, that's a pretty salient thing to think about. Um, public perception has actually changed a lot in that time. And if you think about New Zealand with endemic TB and its possum population and deer, a reminder that success can be transient. And a, spread of disease, uh, and a spread of diseases through feral animals. I, it's something that I feel quite passionate about. That I've seen deer, pigs, goats and dogs appear in our landscape in southern New South Wales in the 30 years since I've been at our farm. So um, the numbers have increased um, immensely in that time. But it, it, you wouldn't say that um, tuberculosis, brucellosis and um, equine influenza were fantastic results and Bruce, I certainly concur with those earlier congratulations to you. So now I'll just talk about the bad. Um, in, the, in the 1990s, ovine and then bovine Yoni's disease burst onto the scene. The regulated environment for these two diseases was different. Now there will probably be some different views about this in the room. In OJD, the control system, which failed to spread the whole of the disease, was worse than the disease itself. Finally, sanity prevailed and vaccination for OJD became routine. Sorry, ovine Yoni's disease. However, not before many businesses had regulation induced stress and misery and, and considerable value destroyed in the New South Wales sheep industry. Bovine, bovine Yoni's disease is different. It's endemic in parts of the dairy industry, particularly northeast Victoria. 
Our business joined the map, as I said, in 1996 and have instituted the highest level of on-farm biosecurity since that time, being MN3, monitored negative three in the MAP, the Market Assurance Program. Recently the rules have changed in all states except for WA, which has agreed to go it alone because they think they're going to have international market access, I think. So the situation now in on-farm biosecurity is dominated by, I guess, self-regulation and the new shared responsibility. Like most professional farmers, we take biosecurity very seriously. We have minimum introductions of cattle. They're blood tested for BJD after introduction. We have a veterinary monitored program to control pestivirus, bovine viral diarrhea virus by vaccinating bulls before sale and carefully monitored program of exposure and blood testing in heifers. We hope the implementation of the new legislation will be able to fulfil the new biosecurity aspirations given our current experience with the MAP. Moving to the JBAS, Yoni's Beef Assurance Score, the information available to enable movement of cattle after our bull sale two weeks ago to WA was interesting because the new rules haven't actually been written, but we've winged it and we've spoken to the guy on the border and we've made sure we've met his requirements. Another risk, which I'm going to be a bit provocative about, with the emergence of what I call no-care farming, are part-timers and those philosophically follow holistic principles. And we have, deserved, we have observed uh, disease problems due to lack of routine vaccinations, much the same in the human population. I think there was an, a case of TB recently, uh, which, which shouldn't happen in children. Um, I certainly think climate change is a major factor in, in what we're seeing with the change of um, pests and uh, weeds and diseases and the spread of endemic diseases and plant species from, from hotter areas south. An example was uh, Thyleria, which appeared in our region, and I understand Thyleria has been dormant for, for a long time, but the vir a virulent uh, form of the disease appeared in our, the Murray Valley about 10 years ago. That some herds that were affected lost up to 10% of their stock, calves and cows. Um, and I, you know, this was this was quite a um, a change for us to see that um, in in what is normally a pretty cold winter climate. Weeds such as fleabane and other more subtropical weeds have spread south and east and are appearing at different times of the year with changing rainfall patterns. And if you don't believe that patterns are changing, BOM last year published an incredible map. Uh, for those of us who went to New South to um, university in the 1970s, we learnt that the equidistant rainfall line was Sydney Dubbo and um, BOM, the Bureau of Meteorology published a map last year which showed that that, that equidistant, equi rainfall line uh, north and south has, has moved to the Victorian border. So there's a significant change in 15 years. A major risk is the introduction of pests and diseases by immigrants, both legal and illegal. The linking of climate change and human refugees across the globe pose a heightened risk to Australia. I've been fortunate with ACR to visit PNG recently and see the combination of very high population growth, poor governance and the presence of highly contagious diseases. It confirms how exposed we are to biosecurity threats from our north and the importance of the work by the federal government and, and the Department of, and the North Australian strategy. I think there's a real need for coordinated national research. It is really heartening to see three states in eastern Australia, Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria, uh, with newly refurbished uh, biosecurity facilities for research, including Elizabeth MacArthur Institute at Camden. I guess my question is, are there education and research pipelines producing the next wave of scientists to assist us understand the threats adequately? Or will the impending wave of retirements in plant pathology, for example, see our capacity fall? One culprit is the lack of recurrent funding, the proliferation of short-term funding cycles and the reliance on levy-based industry funds. Both CRCs in this area, the CRC for invasive pest animals and the CRC for plant biosecurity, are scheduled to wind up in 2017 and 2018 respectively. I have no doubt that at a national level a permanent biosecurity institute is needed that coordinates national and global efforts and informs the regulation enacted at a state level. As I see it, there's a pipeline of biosecurity threats, and I think um, Helen described this very well. Diseases such as OJD, OJD thylerian pestivirus were not endemic at previous points in time, some as recent as 10 years ago. We need to understand what the next suite of threats are, our biosecurity capacity, the ones we need to prioritise and the ones we wish to keep out, and, those are the, ones we, and the ones we wish to live with. Thank you.